Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works. Today we are looking at the General by MPC. This is a 125th scale static model of a steam locomotive from the 1800s. It is important to make the point that this is a static model because most of the model railroad hobby consists of runners. That is, models which are capable of moving themselves and hauling model train behind them. This is a traditional model kit which will produce an accurate 125th scale miniature of a real locomotive. There is no provision for motorizing this kit, although with enough engineering I'm sure it could be done. This model represents what is often known as the American type of locomotive. Under the white system of locomotive classification, it is a 440 or a 440. This means that it has four unpowered wheels on a leading truck or bogey, then four powered wheels, and finally it lacks a trailing truck. These are part of the tender, they're not part of the locomotive. The reason it's called the American type is because it was an almost universal design used by almost every North American railroad. Its use, however, was not limited to North America and was eventually used worldwide. The four-wheel leading truck helped the design to follow the often rough track and rights of way typical of early American and Canadian railroads and ensured its popularity in other parts of the world where railroads served to connect isolated communities. By 1900, the type was largely obsolete due to better track conditions and larger designs capable of higher speeds and pulling longer and heavier trains. This particular locomotive represents the locomotive named the General, which was a product of the Rogers, Ketchum and Grosvenor Company built for the Western and Atlantic Railway. At the time, locomotives were often named. During the American Civil War, a party of Union Raiders, led by James J. Andrews, crossed the Confederate lines and hijacked the General and ran it north, intending to do as much damage to the railroad as they went. They were pursued, first on foot, then using commandeered locomotives by the train's conductor, William Allen Fuller. This event would eventually be known as the Great Locomotive Chase. Whether you choose to model the General, or build the model to represent any other 440, is up to you. If you had two kits and were willing to do some minor kit bashing, you could build a diorama of the Golden Spike Ceremony at Promontory Summit. The kit itself dates back at least as far as 1982, and perhaps there were earlier releases. It has also been released by AMT and AMT Earl, and in the UK it was marketed by Airfix at one point. Unfortunately, the Scalemates website information about this kit is a little dodgy. If anyone can tell us about any releases prior to 1982, please let us know in the comments below. What we have here is the brand new boxing by MPC as part of Roundtrue's continuing program of re-releasing kits from their past brands. So let's take a look at the box. We've got this nice beautiful painting on the front. Looks like a watercolor. The sides are all basically identical. The back of the box is a departure from recent round two practice in that they don't have a sprue map or anything like that. They do have close-up pictures of various parts of the model, as well as a little blurb about the Andrews raid. One interesting thing about this box is, is that it's English only. There's no French, there's no Spanish, or any of the other languages that are often put on here. So I'm not sure if maybe this was only intended for the American market, but uh, it is available here in Canada. So let's take a look inside. So one thing I would like to call your attention to is manufacturing location and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but Kalkaska, Michigan, USA. And that's kind of refreshing that this was molded in the United States. However, the box and it was all produced in China. But you know what? I think it's refreshing to see that somebody in North America said, you know what, we can mold this just as inexpensively as they can overseas and bid on the business and round two was willing to give them a chance. Well, the first time I looked in here, I thought that maybe this piece of cardboard was a copy of the cover, but it's just for protection. But as you can see from the dents, it really does keep the parts from poking up through the top of the box. So we've got the instructions, 
And we've got two brass sprues, which is a little bit different. Normally you expect to find chrome. We've got this bag with a bunch of black parts in it. And it looks like this is probably for the tender. Another bag with black sprues, and it looks like most of the locomotive is in there. We have these two parts, which go together to form the base. We have a bag with some red sprues in it, and that's for the cab and the wheels. And then finally, several gray sprues. The clear parts, fortunately, are bagged up separately to keep them nice and safe. And finally, we have the decal sheet, which is actually quite extensive, really. So here's our decal sheet, and it looks to be nice and neatly molded. It is very glossy, though, so uh, depending on what sort of finish you want on your locomotive, you might have to dull it down afterwards. They do give you an awful lot of numbers here, so should you choose to make your locomotive a different number than the one they want, you can certainly go ahead and do that. So here are our instructions, and like the box, they're in English only. Like I said, a little bit surprising seeing as most model kits have at least two and sometimes six or seven languages on them, and it'll give you a history of uh, the development of the 440, talks about wood burners, and then of course the Andrews Raid. There is no sprue map. And these instructions I'm pretty sure are basically just a reproduction of the original instructions. So, hey, they don't start with the cockpit. Cockpit, this is a train. They do start with the base, and you can see the rails are separate. And then we have the tender, building the tank, and the wood load is all one molding, so you're going to have to do a little bit of artistic painting there. And we move on to building the trucks. And this is interesting. You can build the coupler as a Lincoln pin, which is pre-Civil War, and a knuckle coupler, otherwise known as a Janie. And then they finish off with basically how to put the decals on and some of the finer details. Then we move on to the actual locomotive itself. And we've got the boiler halves and the smokestack. Then we finally have the interior, the cab. And then we've got the seats controls, finishing up of the cab, and then we have the undercarriage, we've got the main frame of the locomotive, installing it under the boiler, And we have the, the pilot assembly, otherwise known as the cow catcher. We've got the various plumbing and valve gear going on. <clears throat> you ever notice how none of us can turn the pages and the instructions when we show them to you? We have more plumbing, handrails. And you can see the bell being installed, the headlight, side rods, and then we have the decals that go on the cab itself. Fairly straightforward instructions. And then they have a final tip here on um, basically tying the locomotive down to the stand. Which come in handy if you're going to be picking it up and moving it. Here's the first of our brass sprues. And 
There doesn't appear to be any flaws or anything in the finish, nor do there, does there seem to be any uh, flash. There's a little bit here on the sprue. There doesn't seem to be any in on the parts, which is important because otherwise you're, uh, you're not going to be able to touch it up. And here is the steam dome and looks like the top of the sandbox. Here's the bell along with some of the other bits of plumbing. And this is the nameplate. That one goes on to the base. And down here, you might not be able to see it on camera, but it says built by, and then you can put your name in there, which is kind of a nice touch. Now this is from the bag that had the locomotive parts in it. And we can see here is the smokestack and one half of the boiler. And then it looks like two of the wheels for the front truck. And once again, I don't see any serious flash issues or anything like that. This appears to be one half of the main frame. And these are your rails. Basically, there's two pieces of rail for each of the uh, pieces of the base. <clears throat> This will be the top of the smokestack. Now this type of smokestack is now it's known as a, as a balloon stack. And it was usually found on wood burning locomotives because there would be a lot of sparks and that sort of thing you wouldn't get with uh, a coal or oil burner. And uh, steam locomotives could actually set fire to forests and um, pastures as they went through them if they didn't have a spark arrestor stack like this. So here's the other side of the locomotive frame. And here's the last sprue from that bag. Once again, we've got the two pony truck wheels and the boiler and the firebox. And I think this is the cab floor. And you should be able to see the wood grain molded in there. So that's pretty nice. Looks like we're already starting to get a few pieces come off like that one. So here are the contents of the second bag of black sprues and we have more wheels. These would be for the tender. This is the side of one of one of the sides of the tender. And this is the top of the tank. A lot of people don't realize that, uh, tenders actually have a U shaped tank and the fuel fits in between. And this sprue has the other side of the tender. This is the back of the firebox right here. Uh, this would be the front of the boiler. And then we have some pieces of the lamp, the light at the front. This would be the throttle, oftentimes known as the Johnson bar. And of course, we have more parts of the tender. These are the inside of that U that would be containing the wood. These are some of the coupler parts. And these were probably the Lincoln pin couplers for the pre-Civil War option. And it looks like we have had another part come astray. This is the underside of the tender. And as you can see, they've molded in wood grain here as well. And these are probably, there's some nicely molded chains here and some piping. I'm guessing at some of these parts. So now for the red parts. This is the what's known as the pilot, although most people like to call it the cow catcher. And this obviously is where the pilot was living. Here we have the roof of the cab, and this is the internal framing of the roof. So certainly is going to be detailed. It's not like you're going to have areas where uh, the structure is not represented. Then we have the main drivers. 
and you can see where the rods fit on and these are counterweights to make up for the weight of the rod and the last of the red sprues we have the cab parts We've got the sides the front and the back of the cab and nicely molded and, and this is one of these kits where if you really didn't want to paint it you could probably get away with it although I certainly would would want to repaint all the parts so on to the gray parts and here is the uh, the wood in other words the fuel and these are really quite nicely detailed although it is going to be a challenge to paint because you're going to have to identify what is bark and what is the interior parts of the wood and then probably give it a, a brownish blackish wash on top but I could see this taking you oh a few sessions at your hobby bench that's for sure and this one these are all of the truck side frames and this is the front of your log bunk and these are part of the frames probably for the tenders trucks I'm not sure what this tongue is for and the final sprue is this one and this would be the frame for the leading truck and probably side frames for that truck this is the front of one of the piston cylinders and these would be the main rods right here and I don't see anything that gives me pause like the ejector pin marks all seem to be on the inside or areas that are going to be unobtrusive these are the fenders that go over the main drivers and you may or may not choose to use those depending on how you how you model your locomotive and different railroads have different practices some would have fenders some did not so the last two big parts other than the the clear parts are for the base and it kind of locks together like this and your rails get glued on the top now you could paint this gray and give it a black wash or you could go to a hobby shop that specializes in uh, model railroading supplies and they actually sell different colors of ballast that's what they call the rock that the ties sit in and you could simply spread that on there and that might look a little bit more realistic and you'll also want to decide how you want to finish your ties do you want them to be very very black in other words heavily creosoted or do you want them to look like they basically had you know just chopped down the trees and thrown them down as ties with very little uh, preservation this kit does offer you an awful lot of options and things like that and there is a simulated wood grain on the side if you didn't like that you could probably buy a wood laminate and apply that and stain it now normally we can't show you the completed model during our reviews but this time due to special circumstances we can now it might still have a little bit of dust on it but this was built approximately in 1982 from one of the original releases of the kit and this was done by my dad Chris and you've seen some of his work before with the Pinto I just thought it would be nice if we could actually see one put together and we've put a yardstick next to it so you can get some idea of how much space it's going to take up and just about comes to a little bit more than 27 inches mind you his is mounted on a wooden base just to give it a little bit more structure now we don't have a 125th scale horse and buggy which would be appropriate to pose next to it so we have a Pinto and a Ford Louisville in 125th scale just once again to give people some idea of how large this model is and it is quite large 
and you can see what the load of wood looks like all painted up and needs a, needs a little bit of TLC. It's been up on a display shelf for quite some time. But then most things need a little bit of TLC after 35 years. And as you can see, he has the post-Civil War coupler on there. So thanks for watching Dan's Model Works, and until next time, keep on modeling.